Welcome back to part three. Before we get started, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Pramp. Pramp is an awesome website where you can get paired with other individuals and do mock interviews. Technical interviews can be extremely challenging and Pramp is going to give you what you need to succeed at these. On top of that, companies are using Pramp to find talent. This means that you can go on Pramp, do a couple of interviews, get some experience, and then do an actual interview with a real company for a real job. There are people that have used Pramp to get offers at Google, Microsoft, Twitter, and more. I'm positive you guys are not gonna be disappointed, so please be sure to check out the link in the description. Now let's get back to our video series, part three, where we're gonna start talking about how to branch, source control, deployments, all kinds of great stuff. So let's get started. Once we have this basis, we want our application to do different things depending on the input. For example, if we made a game that you had to be 13 years old to play, we might have something like this. Less than 13, no, you don't get access. If you're greater than or equal to 13, then yes, you get access. If age is greater than 12, we can do something such as print age. So that's a very simple output, but that is only going to print if age is greater than 12. So you can see we essentially branched our program based on the input. What this means is that in our diagram, we can have our code in the middle. We could have two inputs, less than 13, and then greater than 12, and then two outputs. For example, instead of printing the age, we could say welcome, and then two outputs, yes or no. So you can see it starts to get more complex, which is awesome. Generalizing makes our programs dynamic. What that means is every single execution is not going to do the same thing. If you find really old websites online, they will present the same thing no matter what. There's no options to log in. There's no forms to fill out. It's just an about page, maybe another page, a blog. And these are all hard-coded web pages. That means they are not dynamic. A dynamic website is when you sign in and it says, Welcome, Caleb. Here are five new things that might interest you. This changes depending on who's signed in and what my interests are. Dynamic websites are just a really good example of dynamic applications, but in reality, almost all applications need to be dynamic. What that means is that there's more than one output. Our example took age from input, but you're not always going to want to do this. A lot of times you're going to get this information from a database, a text file, configuration file, anything like that. These files allow us to make our program dynamic without having to ask the user a thousand questions every time they open the application. <laughs> so this means that if something's not working right, a tech support person could go in the configuration file, maybe change a couple things and see if the application works now. And this technique allows us to give one code copy to the customer, one deployment, and then we can just change a couple little things to make the application act in different ways. So anytime you can get something in a configuration file database other than hard coding, that is exactly what you wanna do. The question now is how do we get from a simple three to four line application to a huge application that supports tons of users? Well, we need to be able to scale. We need to be able to grow our application. And one of the challenges is organization and deciding what to build because Applications are actually really hard to build. <laughs> and I'm not just saying that because I'm terrible at it, even though I might be. <laughs> so we need some kind of framework to think about building applications. And one of the most common frameworks to use is called Agile. The way Agile works is you take your application and you break it up into what are known as user stories or cards. And essentially every little piece of your application that needs to have some sort of functionality, you write this down as a user story. So this is essentially writing down how the user is going to interact with your application. This is very similar to like a requirement document. A requirement document is basically going to be the agreement when you sell an application to a company, when you say, hey, we're going to build you a custom application. Here is what you say you need on this application document. Well, Agile is essentially a way to take a requirements document and formulate that into something that's more actionable, more bite-sized pieces. The next thing is that we have sprints. Sprints are usually two weeks long, and essentially at the beginning of each sprint, what we're going to do is figure out what user stories or cards we are going to focus on for those two weeks. And at the end of every two weeks, we should have a completely functional product. So for example, if this is a timeline and we just started, right? Two weeks down the road, 
we should have a very, very simple but functional application. What that means is it will compile, there's minimal bugs, and even though it's simple, the application still works. Then we essentially add features every two weeks until we have what's known as the MVP or the minimal viable product or something like that. <laughs> essentially, we want to build the absolute minimum that is required for applications. Not just to be lazy, that's not the point here. I don't buy into the whole you should be lazy thing. What I'm saying is you wanna build the minimum required because that's what was agreed upon and it reduces bugs and it allows us to get the product out the door faster and then add capabilities rather than just postponing deployment over and over and over and over again. Now at the end of those two weeks, we might have a working application, but that's not something we're going to give to the customer every two weeks. We will often have a test server or a, gosh darn it, dropping my chalk everywhere. We will often have a test server or a local deployment server. So for example, if you consider this box your laptop, this is where you type your code. When you're done, you're going to push that code into a test server. And then sometimes you might even have another server, which would be a deployment server. But oftentimes, once it's here, we can check to make sure it's good, and then we can give it off to the customer. And this would be after we reach the MVP, the minimum required to have a working functional application. So this is when the customer gets what they agreed to with the requirements document and the contract. So the process of sending our code to the test server, we can think of that as, hey, my code should be working. I am going to send it off to production. This is known as a deployment. And obviously it's a test deployment because things could be wrong. So often we will deploy our code to this test server as if it was the customer, and then we'll have people run tests to make sure that the code works the way it's supposed to. And often these tests are going to be from a user perspective. So people might go through these user stories and say, oh, does this button do what it's supposed to do? Does this drag bar work the way it's supposed to? And if all of those things pass, then it's good to hand off to the customer once the uh, minimum viable product is met. Once we have met the minimum requirements, we may still have to do updates. In that situation, we'd go through the same process make an update, test to make sure the update works, and then give it off to the customer whenever it's ready. Now, the thing that the customer gets is not the source code. Now, when I had the diagram, I did tell you guys that they take the, the code and put it on their machines, and that's kind of how it works. But generally, and this can kind of depend on what programming language you're using, so don't take this 100%, but generally you're going to have what's known as an executable. If we zoomed in on that diagram, this is the input, this is the output. We're actually going to have the code. This is the source code. Once that source code is good to go, we then compile that source code. And that is going to give us an executable. So this process is known as compiling. This is only going to apply to some languages because not all languages are compiled. I'm not gonna get into all the different languages and which ones are compiled and everything. Just know that the, the big ones like C, C++, C Sharp, Java, these are all compiled languages. Then there are interpreted languages that don't work exactly the same way. These are going to have the code and go through them one line at a time as they're executing. So there's a little bit of a difference here, but essentially the way you deploy is gonna be very similar. It's really just a matter of how the programming language works on the computer. So don't get caught up on the details, just know that some languages are compiled and some are interpreted. And some, like C Sharp, Java, they're actually both. They're first compiled to a uh, intermediary language and then they are interpreted. So that one is a little bit of an oddball and we can worry about that another day. <laughs> the main thing that I'm wanting to tell you guys is that the source code is often kept proprietary, it's kept secret, unless you're doing what's known as open source. Open source applications are when you give people access to the actual source code and you might store it somewhere to be publicly viewed. Source code can get very large and very cumbersome, so we often need a very organized central place to store this source code. And often this will be in a repository. This concept is known as source control and the most common type is known as 
Git. So Git is a source code management system. It allows you to store your code and also work with peers on the same code. And if you want, you can take that code and store it in a central location. And this is often done with open source projects. So you may have heard of something called GitHub, right? If you haven't heard of GitHub, that's fine, but it's essentially a source code repository where it allows you to store your code in a central location for others to view. So on GitHub, you have two options. You can make your source code public or you can make it private. If it's public, then your project is open source. If it's private, then it's closed source, it's proprietary, you're probably selling it, and it's your, it's your uh, secret recipe for success. Obviously, this was just an introduction to programming. I couldn't cover everything, but this will give you the foundation and also paint that picture of the big view. So as you start learning a programming language, you can kind of realize where things fit in to that picture. So that means now that you got the basics, you got to learn a programming language. So what I would encourage you guys to do is to subscribe and watch out for a new video that's going to be introduction to programming because this video is going to get you started with programming and you don't have to know anything. It's gonna talk about how to get started writing your code, how to structure your programs, and how to end up with a final product. So it's gonna be awesome. So please check that out, guys, and thank you for watching. Please be sure to like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.